Before the next episode of XJob Downloaded starts, I have a big favour to ask. If you've enjoyed any of our episodes so far, please can you click on the follow button on your platform. I'm on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon and YouTube. It costs nothing to follow, but makes a real difference to me as a podcast producer. Thank you. This interview is being tape recorded. My name is Paul Maleri and this is X Job Downloaded. And today I'm going to interview Louise Broadfoot. Now, Louise is currently in Melbourne, Australia. She's a former police officer, current captain with the Australian Army, reserves, I believe. Is that right? That's right. And yep. now you have got an amazing job with Tennis Australia. Have I said yes, that, I do. Have I said that right? Have I got that in the right way? You have got that 100% right. So thank you so much for taking part today. We've had a little chat before we started this, but Melbourne is a, a long way and you're in the middle of your winter and I can see that you're sitting there in your gilet. It can't be that cold in Melbourne today. Well, it was about three degrees when I left home this morning. What? So, yeah, I do live a, a little bit out of town in the in the Macedon Ranges area, so it does get pretty cold. Um, and to be honest, I'm an absolute sook when it comes to the cold weather. <laughs> Only an Australian would understand I'll, a sook. <laughs> I'll put that. <laughs> I'll put that down to spending most of the last twenty years in Queensland. But having said that, I have been back down south for nearly a year now, so I should be over it. But no, uh, it it is cold. The wind's getting up a bit outside, and it's you know it's it's quarter past five in the evening here. It's nearly night time. Yeah, time to start. Time to start warming up. So where did it all begin for Louise? Where were you born and, and how did you, you know, get involved with the police service? Uh, I was born here in Melbourne and um, did all my schooling and university uh, down here. Um, and the reason I got involved with the police service, I've, it's never been, you know, I'm not aware of any other family members who've been coppers or anything like that. Uh, for me, it sort of started when I was about 10 or 12. I remember watching, we... We used to have a science show on ABC TV here on a Thursday night called Quantum, and they did about a six-part um, series taken from the BBC about forensic science, and it was all – so this would have been ah, late 80s, I reckon, and, you know, it had all of this stuff that I thought was really cool where, you know, so a murder was solved by, I don't know, a scribble on a page and they found the imprint on a couple of pages below or something like that. Yeah, just those all of those little yeah. kind of – Puzzle, solving puzzles and stuff like that that, you know, the forensic science boffins do. Um, and that really kind of captured my imagination. And I, you know, I wanted to be 100 different things as, as a kid, as 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 everybody does. Um, the, the number one thing I always wanted to do was to play cricket for Australia. Um, but as far, as far as an actual job and a career path goes, when I finished school, um, I did science at university and then joined the police because I thought that's kind of the way to get into forensics. Um, so I joined the Victoria Police, decided that I actually just enjoyed being a copper, um, ended up spending about 20 years in the police, both in Victoria and in the Queensland Police Service, never did a day of forensic science. <laughs> um, but that's sort of Brilliant. that's how it came about. So what was the inspiration to transfer up to Queensland? Because they are, you know, the geographics of Australia is such that it's like comparing apples with bananas, isn't it? They're, they're just two completely different places. Uh, yes, certainly long distance and, you know, much much different climate and all that sort of thing. Uh, to be honest, policing is much the same in both states, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I moved mainly because I, I met my partner. Right, um, cool. Who was in the, in the Queensland police at oh, the time. And, right. Um, long time down the track and still still together and oh, now fantastic. I've dragged her back down, dragged her down oh, to Melbourne. <laughs> good for you. That's that's fantastic. How's she coping with the cold? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> I've got family in Mission Beach, as you know, and I've also got family um, just outside Brisbane, and they live the life up there. I mean, even in the winter, they're moaning that it's twenty two degrees and. They're going yeah, out on their boat and they're having to wear a T-shirt. It's just, oh, come on, please. Oh, no. Yeah, it's soft. It is. Um, <laughs> so what area, what area of policing were you involved in? Um, I did – so I did about four years of general duties policing in Victoria and then moved up to Queensland and did 
probably another 18 months of, of general duties up there. Uh, and then um, went and did all my detective training and became a detective. So I worked in plain clothes for about nine years uh, and then got promoted to sergeant and moved up to up to Mackay, so a bit further up. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thousand Ks north of Brisbane um, uh, in a unit called uh, the TCS Tactical Crime Squad, which is a bit of a balance between sort of first response and um, proactive policing and, you know, a, a bit more investigative work. Um, and that was that was pretty much where I where I finished my police career and then just on a on a, on a bit of a whim I applied for a job with Tennis Australia. Fantastic. And is Mackay is that a, a a mining area? Yes. Yeah. So how do I know these things? But yeah, it's, I was uh, going to say <laughs> I'm, I'm very impressed. Yeah, mining and sugar. Yeah. Mining and sugar. Yeah. And well, trees. up up there it's it's further north it's all sugar and bananas, isn't it? It's as you That's go right. go through. Yeah. Yeah, so tropical. very, very tropical, absolutely stunning part of the world. I mm. highly recommend Mackay to anyone who, anyone who wants a nice place to go for a holiday. And what sort of um, jobs would you deal with as a detective out there? Um, so I wasn't a detective in Mackay, but I, right. I did my my, my my work in plain clothes, um, firstly in a place called Logan, uh, south of Brisbane, and then um, and then in Hendra, which is sort of one of the inner northern Brisbane suburbs, and. I mean, I'd imagine that all of the, you know, all all of the crime stories They're all, are, are all pretty, the same. very similar yeah. to what you guys would would get over there. Um, we, Logan we, was a fairly interesting area. Um, Logan and Hendra were two very different areas, so socioeconomically. So, right. Um, some 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 real real challenges in in Logan. Um, in, great place to be a copper, though, because you know you never have a dull moment. No, you get get the variety there. The um, mm. because w- w- there were two officers that were murdered in Queensland late last year, if I remember rightly. Yes, yeah, you're right. That was that was out west, out near Dolby Way. Yeah, in the southwestern part of Queensland. Um, yeah, that was absolutely tragic. Well, I, I I was in London about three weeks ago, maybe a bit longer now. And I went to a book launch and I was talking to this lady and she was a police officer from London and she'd relocated out there. And those cops were yeah. ki- killed at the bottom in the house behind hers. I wow. mean, yeah, uh, there's a couple of things there. Mind you, it's still probably 40 acres away. Yeah, 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 yeah ab- big, absolutely. Great big, yeah. vast open spaces a- Absolutely. There, yeah. And how, how are you received in, in the different places? So Victoria, policing in Victoria and then going up to Queensland. You say about the socioeconomic element how were the police received in the two different areas um oh i would probably draw more distinction between logan and hendra than necessarily victoria and queensland right. i guess it's the same as anywhere there's there's you know there's there's good parts of the city and bad parts of the city so to speak but i would describe the difference between logan and hendra as logan's the kind of place where if you drive around in a marked car and you go past a you know, somebody with with a five year old kid, the five year old kid will probably do give you the finger. Give you the bird, yeah. Whereas if you drive around drive around Hendra, the five year old kid will probably give you a wave right. and ask you to flash your lights at them. Oh, well, there you go. That, that yeah, yeah, that that that's <laughs> answered the question, isn't it? But did you you enjoyed your time there? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, yeah. I I, I enjoyed pretty much. You know, you have you have days, but I enjoyed my policing career on the whole very much. Do you, do you think that yeah. the police have evolved in Australia around inclusivity since you joined? We certainly have here. Yes, they definitely have. Um, that doesn't mean that, that they've evolved far enough, in no. my opinion. Um, but, yeah, they certainly have, you know, I, I think policing is very different now than it was back in 2001 yeah. when I joined. Um, and and for the better, um, on the whole, yeah. I know you 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 hear you still hear a few people sort of you know bemoaning the la- the lack of the good old days. Um, but in a lot of ways, I think the good old days were only good for some people. And now I think the I think the job is a lot more. Yeah, yeah inclusive is probably a better word. Yeah, but yeah. There's yeah. As I said, I think it's still got a fair way to go, but 
it's definitely a better place. I, I certainly think we have here. There are there are places that need improvement, that, you know, and the, we hear it all the time from senior management around how they're going to improve things. But the fact is, they were part of the problem thirty years ago. So how are they? That's exactly right. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm aware of some of the issues that the Met, for example, have been going through over the last few years, and uh, and a lot of the stories that you that I've heard from over there, they certainly resonate with things that would not be out of, you know, would not be out of place with things that have happened over here in, in policing circles. But we but we do mirror each other's culture. Absolutely. Australia and the UK, we, we mirror one another, which I think is, is, is brilliant in a lot of ways. I vividly remember going to Perth and I met this old detective and you, you'd have thought he'd have come out of a, a 1970s police film, you know, but because policing was, you know, a little bit back from where we were. But yeah. great, great, great people. But as you say, it was it was good for some people, not for everyone. I've got friends who, and she won't come on on here, and I understand it. But when she was identified as being gay, she had a terrible, terrible time in her police station to a point where they were putting obscene pictures through her locker. God forbid. That that happens now because if it did, then those people should be taken out and publicly flogged. Yeah, yeah, it's. Ah. But you yeah, know, I, it... I I hope it doesn't still happen. <laughs> I I think I I think for for the you know I guess from an LGBTI perspective, it, it, policing is a much easier career for a gay woman still than it is for a, for a gay man, um, and it's. Very, still a very difficult area for any for a trans person. Oh yeah, yeah, it is absolutely. Yeah. And and I've got I've got uh, trans friends in in Essex. Um, I've got. Uh, it's interesting you say that because when I was at my last posting, I had a number of gay guys in the office, and it, you know the, the atmosphere was fantastic. We had such a laugh, and. I don't. I don't think. I mean, I might be wrong, and I, I, hopefully, when one of them retires, I'll, I'll, I'll get him on there. But I, I didn't notice any difference between, you know, if there was a gay guy or a gay girl in the office. There was. It was less obvious if the girl was gay than the because the, yeah. the, the guys were more out there, and you know, they were just like yeah. very, very flamboyant. And, but yeah, we had, that's we, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I mean, I think a lot of that you would know. Like, it could be completely different. At one station compared to another station, yeah. five k's down the road, and so much of that just comes down to the culture within that group of people and the leadership of that group of people and all of that sort of stuff. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely. It's, it's right. difficult to generalise. Yeah, you know, yeah, a whole abs- absolutely. Job or a whole service or whatever, absolutely. but yeah, there are some great areas to work for. You know, for anybody to work, and there's yeah. some, some areas that you, yeah, even now you still wouldn't want to go there. But it only takes one person. To yeah. absolutely ruin a, a relationship, a, a lifestyle, and by the the way that they they treat individuals, the bullying then starts to ostracise, and it's it's you know as I say, it's unforgivable. What what point did you join the army? Um, so I'd always been interested in joining the military, even as I went through school. But as I said, I was I was pretty. Um, pretty focused on playing sport um, all the way through school and university and that sort of stuff. And I kind of understood that joining the military and trying to play sport um, weren't necessarily something that could go hand in hand. So um, when I got the opportunity, it was actually when I um, when I left the Victoria Police and moved up to Queensland, I had about six months between police services um, and sort of used that six months to go through the recruitment process with the with the Army Reserve. Fantastic. And what, so, what sports yeah. did you play though? Because obviously, it's a massive um, part of your life now. But what what were you playing then? Uh, well, cricket was always always my number one sport. Um, my my dad was a good cricketer. My granddad was also a good cricketer back in the day. Um, and so, you know, I grew up playing all the backyard cricket and everything like that. Um, joined a joined a, joined a ladies cricket club in Melbourne when I was about twelve. Um, and yeah. I mean, I was I was obsessed with it all the way <laughs> as a 
as a youngster, you know, I used to write in my school diary um, how many days, like once the cricket season finished, did the countdown to the days when the cricket season would start again, that sort of thing. And, and um, you know, I was by then, I, like when I was sort of getting to the stage of finishing school and trying to make make career decisions, um, you know, I'd, I'd been playing in state junior teams and, and that sort of stuff. So um, not that back in the 90s you know you, you were never going to make a living or a career as a as a as a female cricketer but um I, I guess I never you know it certainly wasn't a possibility back then but it was always something that I wanted to do and um I, I was you know I did eventually play a handful of games um for Australia did you in the yeah fantastic yeah. I d- I didn't Google. I should have Googled you before I started this conversation. I wouldn't have acted so surprised. That's fantastic. Oh no, that's all right. No, so that's uh, when I said when I said I played. I think before we started, or yeah. before we officially started the uh, conversation, we were talking about how seeing those crowds at um, women's sporting events, yeah. you know, made me made me quite emotional. And I said watching the Australian women play over there, play over there now in front of full full crowds at Lords, like I. I was lucky, and I went on an Ashes tour to England in 2001. Did you? And um, we played, we played at Lords. I was 12th or 13th that day, so I had a massive lunch and carried the drinks. But we, <laughs> we were playing. You know, we played at Lords. We played at Headingley, but we played in front of about 25 people, and they were all friends and family of the players. Like I don't think there were certainly no paying members of the public. But do you not think though that those theatres of sport doesn't matter who's standing there? The fact that you've walked onto those hallowed turfs, it's like walking onto. Oh. You know, is it, MCG, yeah. the Wacker, where, wherever it is, if you get the opportunity to go into these places, in your own mind, it's full. You, you, oh, you yeah. Oh, I tell you what, I've, I've played, been lucky enough to play a couple of games at the MCG again in front of about twenty-five people. Um, but to stand in the middle of that field and look all around you, you know, a ground that holds a hundred thousand people, and just. Imagine what it must be like when there's somebody in every single one of those seats. Like the the stands are so big, they kind of it's like they close in on you. It's it's really awe inspiring. Oh, absolutely! And yeah. all those great players that have actually you know that have played there. Yeah, go, go and, and all of the things going you know, right all back. Of the history that's happened there. Yeah, you know. You see, I, I live in Essex, so I'm I'm from the land of Alistair Cook and Graham Gooch. Yep. And I I, I went to. I watched the cricket the other week over at Essex, and and Graham Gooch walks around and chats to everybody, and it's just oh, you know these super. are these are yeah. boyhood heroes f- f- yeah. for me. And a, is Essex the ground with the tree on the in the middle, like on the, in no, the outfield? No, no, no. It's um the county ground is quite. I say new. It's not new at all, but it, no, it hasn't got a tree in the outfield. I don't know where that is actually. Oh, I know one of the county grounds over there. I mean, no. Yeah, they might have upgraded it by now but I know that at some stage there was a county ground there that had a tree in the outfield anyway yeah I, I will look it up but but I was a member of the Lords Taverners and you have the Lords you have the Lords yeah. Taverners out in Australia don't you have the reciprocal oh, out I, there I, I won the Lords Taverners Junior Cricketer of the Year award in about 1993 did yeah, you really so, yeah yeah they, they used to put on it was awesome actually they they put on a fantastic breakfast um at the Melbourne Hilton on Boxing Day and then everyone goes from the breakfast walks Across the road to the MCG for the Test match. How brilliant is that? Yeah, so I, that's, I, it's fantastic. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, it. I'm pretty rubbish at it, but uh, into this and um, yeah, well, I, I'm I'm blown away. If I'm perfectly honest with you, it's fantastic. So, did you get to do India, and did you did you travel a lot with them, or not a great deal? I mean, uh, England's pretty I, cool, though, right? Yeah, England's good. I, I mean. You know, it's it's one of those things. I'll, ne- I'll never complain about having played for Australia, but I was I was very much one of you know one of the last picked and one of the first dropped. Uh, I was I so I went to in in the senior team. I went to New Zealand for a World Cup in about I think it was two thousand when we were runners up, and then two thousand one the Ashes over in the UK, um, and then didn't make the side for a few years, and then over to South Africa in two thousand and five for the World Cup, wow. which we did end up winning um but yeah i never I, I i never made it to the subcontinent with um with any representative teams until last year i managed to uh the adf sent the australian army women's cricket team to bangladesh 
So I wow. went to Bangladesh last year, quite unexpectedly. Wow. What yeah, was, what which was, was that an, like? an amazing experience. And the Bangladesh women just tied a like a, a one one day series with the Indian women. So yeah, I, and some of those girls, like we managed to have a training session with the Bangladesh uh, with their open team, and we played a game against their academy team. Like they whipped us. They were so good. You know, we're talking about fifteen year old kids, and they were unbelievably good. Um, but Hey, I can, you know, I got to play against some of the Bangladeshi internationals, which was pretty awesome. Yeah. Do, uh, do you know, you think how far women's sport has gone in the past 20 years, how quickly, yeah. you know, it's catching up and rightfully so, as we, we were talking earlier on. And and it's quite inspirational, the, the stuff that is now taking place, I think it's, it's brilliant and long may it continue. What did you do in the army or what do you do in the army? Uh, I'm in the Royal Australian Corps of Transport. Um, I'm a, ru- I must say, I'm a, I'm a rubbish transport officer. I haven't, I haven't had a core posting since 2017. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a transport officer in, in title, but I'll, I would certainly not say at the moment a transport officer by trade. Uh, at the moment, I work um, in a CIMIC unit, so I don't know what you call it over there. Civil, Mil- Civil Military Corporation is oh, what okay. the acronym is. It's kind of like one of the information-related capabilities. Um, uh, I think in the UK military, it would be one of the functions of, I think you guys, of your 7-7 brigade? Or so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I guess... Um, helping to sort of reduce the friction, I suppose, between the presence of a military body and the civilian population. Oh, okay. In, that, yeah, in, no, that in, makes in, sense. In a context, so in Australia, so, you know, I think a lot of the work that Simic's been doing lately has been the disaster relief when we've had floods and bushfires and that sort of stuff. Sure. Um, but, you know, certainly also um, in international theatres, uh, yeah. a lot of that sort of, you know, as I said, the, the white space, the civil space sort of work, um, including things like the, you know, gender advisor roles and the community. Yeah, to, to, I can to, go on, but yeah. no, but it brings the community. <laughs> it brings community and the military closer. Is that the? Yes, but also I guess assessing assessing the effect in, effectiveness of the military operations. Um, right. Or, or ineffectiveness of the military operations on how and on how it's impacting the community. And I guess a good example from locally over the last couple of years, as I said, the the um, they've done a lot of work with the um, with the floods and bushfires that have been happening down here over the last few years. And one of the things, you know, the army rolls in, everyone's like, "Beauty, the army's here. They're going to fix everything." And you know the army because we're there. The army army wants to fix everything because that's what of we course. do. Yeah. <laughs> same as same as pol- policing in a lot of ways. Um, and so you know, for example, a farmer might say, "Oh, look, all my all my fences have been destroyed. You guys have got construction equipment here. Can you guys give me a hand building some fences?" And you oh, know, cool. ma- maybe naively, a, a commander will say, "Oh, that sounds like a great idea. We'll get some good PR out of that. Build a heap of fences um, <laughs> without actually recognizing the fact that." Um, there's a local fencing contractor who's, you know, maybe just lost a whole lot of work and could really use the work themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess so, I, you know, that's what I mean by assessing the impact of the, the military presence on the civilian population. You know, it, I, I guess it's trying to think a little bit more broader than yeah. let's fix this problem and move on. Yeah, no, no. Does that I, make sense? I, yeah, no, I get it. Did you join as a private? No, um, I went straight in as a lieutenant. Oh, did you? So you, you took a commission yeah. and yeah, um... so, yep, yeah. I, I I originally started the recruitment process um, to to go in as a soldier, um, and then sort of, you know, at the at the time, as I said, I'd only ever been a constable in the police, and I sort of thought, oh well, you know, well, maybe it'll be interesting to try and get on the other side of the fence and and be part of the decision making. To a certain extent, rather than just always one of the people who gets affected by the decisions. Yeah, yeah. It, rather than rather than being told what to do, you're telling other people what to do. Yeah. I, no, that that makes absolute sense. I mean, it's um, it's pretty cool. When you take your commission out there, 
you you mentioned earlier that you came over went to Sandhurst. Was that part of your training process? No. So 2018. Um, so I've done two lots of full time service with the army, both for deployments. So 2015, oh, wow. I I spent six months in Darwin um, with with a company of soldiers and sailors doing um, border security work. Yeah. Um, and then 2018, uh, I had oh, just over a year off work from policing um, and went to Afghanistan for nine months. Wow. Uh, working with with um, British, Danish, New Zealand um, soldiers and officers at the Afghan um, National Army Officer Academy just outside of Kabul and we were mentoring the Afghan instructors who were instructing the Afghan cadets, um, but because they were all sort of being instructed along the quote-unquote Sandhurst model, which, to be honest, is also quite very, very similar to the Duntroon model because we kind of took a lot of that Plagiarism training into is the fantastic. Australian Army, obviously. Um, but, yeah, we, we, spent, we spent a couple of weeks at Sandhurst as our sort of pre-deployment training and then I was fortunate enough to go back halfway through my rotation to go and deliver the same well we we changed the instruction somewhat but to deliver the same sort of pre-deployment training to the next lot that were coming in wow. so yeah that's why I managed to have a couple of stints uh at Sandhurst which was again you know you talk about history you know, you, you sort of walk around and go oh, yeah, people like Churchill have been here you yeah. know yeah yeah when you yeah uh, no, it was fantastic it's a, it is a fantastic yeah. place did you get the opportunity to see any of the UK at that? Because, I mean, you've been to the UK before anyway playing cricket, but did you get the opportunity to see it from a different perspective? Um, didn't get a great deal of time to see the UK, or, uh, you know, other than a couple of trips into London on on those trips to Sandhurst. Um, oh, when I was about six, Dad was a civil engineer. He worked for Shell. So when I was about six, oh. we actually lived in the UK for a couple of years. Oh, there you go early to mid eighties. Um, and so I did a couple of years schooling, um, a couple of years schooling over there in primary school. Um, and I had been back, uh, I, yeah, I've, I've been to the UK quite a few times. I was, I was at Lords the day Glenn McGrath took eight for 38 in 1997. Wow. I think it was, that sounds about right. And I did, I did a gap year that same, that same year. I went and worked in a, worked in a boarding school down in East Sussex, um, for about eight oh, months. Oh, you're a pom. I don't know where, so, yeah, I, I don't know where all this Australian <laughs> bit's coming from. <laughs> um, no, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a place I enjoy visiting. Good. And, yeah, you know, I mean, I know we have this sort of mostly friendly rivalry when it comes to the ashes and all of that sort of stuff, but I think at, I think at heart a lot of the time, you know, Australians and, and Brits – and Kiwis and probably Canadians as well all all see the world through a fairly similar lens. Oh, absolutely. We're all, we're all covered. Especially when you compared to, you know, Americans and and the like. Well, we're all covered <laughs> with the same umbrella, aren't we? At the end of the day, we yeah. you know, we're all from the from similar stock with similar views on on life. In in the army, how often do you have to deploy? I mean, you went to Afghanistan and uh, but how often do you have to yeah, so it's a bit different as a reservist. Um, I mean, you know, I certainly jumped at the chance to do both of those deployments. Um, but you know, I as, as a reservist, I may not ever get another chance. No. Um, and especially, you know, now that we've now that we've moved out of Afghanistan and all of that sort of stuff, the the chances are are certainly, or the opportunities are few and far between now for for reservists. Other than, you know, maybe the odd international engagement kind of exercise here and there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I'm sort of fortunate in that way as a reservist that, yeah. at, you know, it, both of those, you know, both of those things were opportunities that I sought out, uh, rather than just getting tapped on the shoulder and being told that you're going. That's, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes you make your own luck, don't you? What, how do you feel yeah, now? I mean, the full-time military, yeah, I, I couldn't, I couldn't really answer for them, but, no. um, yeah, that I, I think on the whole, and speaking to some of the Brits that I worked with in Afghanistan, you know, some of whom were on like their sixth, sixth or seventh tours and yeah. stuff like that. You know, I, I think even the full-time Australian Army personnel that I was there with, I think maybe some of them were on their second trip, mm. but certainly not to the extent that your guys were. Yeah. How do you feel though? All that hard work that you put into trying to train these 
um, Afghani officers and knowing full well that uh, uh, when that last aircraft took off uh, at the airport there, how, how does that make you feel about what actually took place in Afghanistan? And, you, yeah. I, and I accept that you might not be able to answer this because obviously you're still serving, so... Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll answer it as best I can. And it was, I, I don't think it would be any surprise to anybody, you know, for, uh, certainly for all of the people that I was over there with it. It was, yeah, it was, it was a real blow because um, we felt as though even in the, you know, the relatively short space of time that we were there, for me it was like March till December, um, you know, you felt like we we were making progress and, you know, it was very small, very incremental progress, but there was progress being made um, in terms of their training and, and capability and, you know, one of the one of the roles that I and the other female um, mentors were doing was sort of really pushing hard with the female integration, integrating the female staff and and the female mm. cadets into the into the program and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it was it was really tough. I think it was a real blow when it all went sideways so quickly. Um, I won't, I wouldn't say it was a surprise. I think. Um, even in my fairly limited understanding of everything um, from having seen the, I guess, having, ah, well, let's just say it, it, it wasn't it wasn't a surprise it, to it me was that, always a that it all box. fell apart so quickly. Yeah. Um, but it was still pretty upsetting. And it was also upsetting, um, you know, knowing that people that we'd worked with and, you know, to a certain – struck up some friendships with, like, you know, like our interpreters – um, and some of the, you know, some of the locally employed contractors and the, and the women that we were mentoring, um, you know, not knowing what had happened to a lot of them. Um, I do know that as far as our interpreters go, I know that uh, quite a few of them have made it to Australia, which is fantastic, Brilliant. but also understanding that their families are still back in Kabul and, and in danger. Yeah. Um, but you know, no, I've got no idea what happened to most of the um, Afghan army women that that I worked with quite closely on a daily basis. I've, I've got no idea no. what's happened to any of them, and and you can't you can't imagine that anything good has. No, no. I yeah. I interviewed a, a Afghan interpreter who who made it to the UK. Yeah, I listened to that one. And you can't. Oh, did you? Oh, cool. Yeah. And um, yeah. but, but you <laughs> you just can't imagine what's happening out there and the the way that. That every day the Taliban are making a different rule, and most of it has an impact on the women. Mm. Uh, yeah, most yeah. of it. Most and of it. It's outrageous. I kind of feel like we, especially when it comes to the women, um, but I guess for the country more broadly, I kind of feel feel like we'd sold them this vision of hope and everything like that, um, and then just. Yeah, taking it away really quickly. Yeah, really quickly. Yeah, we we yeah, literally pulled, especially for the women. Yeah, yeah, we pulled the rug, or they've had the rug pulled, and we've walked off into the sunset. Yeah, I say we, we haven't, because there's a lot of people. I I, I said it in that interview. I've, I lost friends out there, and yeah, the, their, and their yeah, deaths that's, were, that's the other thing. Were in vain. People who've lost friends and loved ones yeah. over there, and yeah, you kind of go, well, what was. What was it for? What was the point? Yeah. What was it for? What did we do it for? Why? Why did? Mm. I know why we did it. It was, the, it was the right thing, and absolutely, you know, that's what it is. But so, what? What do we do now? I mean, we 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 left the police, left the police service. Yep. Had you done your time, or was that just a fit of peak and thought, "Oh, I've had enough of this"? Oh uh, no, neither. I mean, we don't have a you know we don't have a twenty year sort of retirement thing. I'm not sure if we thirty. You guys yeah. have that over there. We're thirty. 30? Yeah, okay. 30. For, for us, um, for policing over here, it's you know your compulsory retirement age is sixty, but you know so that means you could do. Yeah, you know, there's, there's some people who do forty years or so in the coppers. Um, no, for me it was. I. I'd reached the stage as a sergeant where I was enjoying what I was doing, um, but I didn't probably like. By, so when was this? Two years ago. So I would have been forty-three, and um, 
you know, I kind of go, well, in five years' time, do I still want to be wrestling drunks in the streets in Early Beach? Nah, probably not. <laughs> I do. Um, you know, what, what are the other options? You know, get promoted to senior sergeant, so you're either the officer in charge of a station, which is very much an off-the-road job and, and you're more or less a human resource manager, mm-hmm. um, or a, a district duty officer, which is the sort of on-road supervisor for all the crews on the road. And I'd done a fair bit of relieving in that and really enjoyed really enjoyed that job itself. Um, the part about that that didn't appeal to me so much was a week and night shift every six weeks. Right. Um, so, I mean, night shift's hard enough in your 20s. It's bloody awful in your 40s. Yeah. Um, and so I just kind of got to that stage where I go, well, you know, should I start looking elsewhere? And and my partner, Tracy, she, she'd been a copper as well. She'd got out a couple of years previous to that and had gone to work in, in horse racing integrity. So, oh, wow. You know, corruption in the racing industry, oh, yeah. that sort of thing. And then it had a, it had a couple of other investigative jobs in government agencies as well. So having seen that, um, you know, firsthand, I was, I was certainly aware that policing skills are transferable and there are other jobs out there that we can do because I think – um, I think that's where a lot of coppers sell themselves short. Yeah, you're right. Is thinking, oh, what what am I going to do? I'm just a just a copper sort of thing. With, I'm yeah. saying that with air quotes. Um, so I knew that there was there were options out there, and I, I I sort of thought, well, you know, I'll start seeing if I can write a resume for a civilian job. Um, let's just see how I go. Thinking it'd probably take me like you know maybe two years to to find something that I could you know, that, that that would accept me and that would be a good fit and all of that sort of stuff. Literally the first, like I looked on Seek, the first job I applied for, I saw this job for Tennis Australia Integrity Officer and I read the job description and I sort of thought, oh, yeah, I reckon I can do that. So I, I typed something up, sent it in, and that, would have, that was like the beginning of June and within like – Six to eight weeks, I had a job offer, and suddenly I'm going, oh, crikey! Now I've got to de- now I've got to decide if I'm actually going to leave the coppers <laughs> or not, <laughs> and you know, p- move back to Melbourne <laughs> and all of that sort of stuff. So, but so I did, and I took. Uh, I mean, I took a twelve uh, twelve month career break from the police. So, mm-hmm. you know, I guess that was just that bit of a security blanket in case I got into this new job and went. Nah. I've made a terrible mistake, but. Uh, you know, as I said, I, I enjoyed my policing career very much. Um, you know, met some awesome people, got some great skills out of it, but I haven't missed it one day. But this new chapter is far. What does an integrity yep. officer do for the Australian tennis? Um, so we look after things and i mean the main the main part of our work is child safeguarding across of sort of all levels of tennis all yep. across australia um but we also do work uh in the areas of sort of anti-doping anti-corruption you know the match fixing kind of stuff with the itia the international tennis integrity agency who are based in london um they send some people out to the australian open every year and we kind of have a pretty good working relationship with them um so it's uh, and also, like member protection issues, so yeah, harassment, bullying, discrimination, abuse, kind of yeah. things within again within all levels of tennis all across the country. So, um, you know, we've I guess in the couple of years that I've been doing this job, we've done things like you know, get rid of parents who've knocked out another parent at another thirteen tournament. Yeah. Or, um, yeah, you know, some 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 yeah. The child safety side of it, as I said, is the majority of our work, and we, and we, as you could probably imagine, any, you know, sport like anywhere else in life where adults and children intersect, there are there are some predators out there. Yeah. And whilst we whilst we can't lock them up, we can certainly keep them out of our sport. And rightfully so. I mean, the, pre- the yeah. preventive strand in any any enforcement role is probably the most important. Because yeah. it, if, if, and 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 also yeah, talking about the preventative side of it. I mean, we also do a lot of policy development and education. We we have an education officer within our team, and just trying to sort of, you know, I guess spread the child safety word to tennis clubs and players and coaches and officials and staff and everywhere across yeah. the country is 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 a huge part of the job as yeah. well. And do you get to travel with it? 
Um, yeah, get to travel a little bit. I haven't travelled overseas with it yet. Yet. I, I would love to one day. I would love to one day get to some of the some of the Grand Slams internationally. But um, yeah, I've done a bit of travel within Australia. Um, yeah, within within the job. Fantastic. And yeah. and, and what I will say about Australia, and I love it as a, as a country. But if you're good at sport, you will be given opportunity in Australia, because I remember going to Perth and it was cricket pitch, rugby pitch, hockey pitch, and it, swimming pool. Yep. As, as far as the eye could see, kids didn't have to travel very far to actually undertake their sporting dreams. And yeah, certainly in the in the in the centres. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah I mean you in get, fur- you get further state. out in the bush, yeah. and you've you've had it, but. Um, but I mean, up in in Cairns, the hockey centre in Cairns is absolutely phenomenal. And mm. and if my my kid was my my kid played, both our kids played hockey, but our oldest played a really high standard. Opportunity would have been far greater for him in Australia than it was in because there's no here. We suffer massively with the. Um, private school and public private school and state school system you know if you went to a particular school you've got more opportunity of getting on um certainly in the hockey world no no cricket has suffered some of this as well yeah yeah I've, I've i've been following some of that in cricket yeah especially you know not just the sort of racism stuff no that, no no you know, that, that's been going on in yorkshire but yeah the public private school divide and and lack of opportunity if you haven't been to the right school and that sort of stuff yeah it's really interesting but that doesn't stand um, in and australia yeah, you're right with what you say over here i think certainly from a sporting context it's much more of a level playing field yeah absolutely um, over here than it probably is over there yeah absolutely and i but I, I think it's a great place when it comes to the only thing i would say is that you don't have match of the day on a saturday evening that's that's my only that's my only criticism of australia because I'm a, I'm a football fan. I'm a yep, but yep. but that said, I've been dragged into um, supporting uh, Townsville. Is it town? No, the Cowboys. Who, the Cowboys. Who, yeah, the Cowboys. I've in been the, dragged in the NRL. In NRL, yeah. and I've got my Maroons jersey and everything else. I, yeah. I've even got an Akubra hat. That's how far oh, down. That's how go. far down the line I am to Australia. Yeah. And I'm hope. a bit disappointed that I can't see your Akubra. Oh, the wait, wait there, wait there a your, second. Hold on. All hold of on. your other nice hats. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Look at you, Crocodile Dundee. Now, I should have really started off with this on, shouldn't I? But, um, but yeah. So. I might not have taken you seriously. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> you know, the fact that we've got a couple of grandkids out there and, and a lovely daughter-in-law and whatever, and they've made our son feel so part of Australia. You know that that's the welcome has been overwhelming, uh, but yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. So how does it, how does your life progress now within the tennis field? What what happens next? And oh, good question. Um, I mean, I, I'm you know certainly enjoying doing the job that I'm doing now. Um, the it's been really really eye opening. I guess the the need. For sporting integrity units, um, you know, in in every sport, and really at a sort of national and international level, um, you know, one day I'd 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 you know look, I'd love to do s- some international kind of you know sports integrity or sports management kind of work. I've I've, I'm, I've signed up to start a master's in international sports management in a Maybe. couple of months. So yeah, so that'll keep me. It'll keep me busy for the next couple of years, um, but I guess with, you know, with one with one eye on the future and maybe trying to, trying to, um, trying to take something up on a, on an international, yeah, international fa- scale or or something. But yeah, I'll, I'll look for the time being. I'm pretty, pretty happy chugging along here at Tennis Australia. I've never really been one to, sort of make five-year plans or anything like that. I've, I've, I've been pretty lucky so far just saying yes to opportunities as they arise. Mm, that's often the best way, isn't it? Mm. And when are you going to get over here again? Well, I'm trying to jag a trip to a sports conference uh, sort of integrity slash safeguarding conference uh, in Norway in February and then add a bit of a – bar to that our important stakeholders like the ITI so I'll certainly let you know if that 
if I manage if you, to pull that one off. If you do, I will buy you a cold one in London somewhere. I wouldn't say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Except uh, it would probably be a warm one, wouldn't it? No, stop it. You Listen. <laughs> <laughs> you, you lot get us so wrong. I, we we got in, we got into the Yeti culture as well. You know, like the the coolers and all that up in in Queensland. Oh right, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like the, yep. the the the. I couldn't believe it. By the time I'd opened the Great Northern, if you didn't put it in a in a koozie or you like in in one of these. Oh yeah, stubby cooler. Stubby yeah. cooler. It was melting in my hand. It was warm, and it was condensation on the outside. I mean, I couldn't, I, I couldn't get over the the. Humidity, and and it is the tropics. I mean, whatever anyone says, and if yeah. you didn't have the, it's no point in moaning about the rain because Tully, as we spoke about earlier on, is the wettest place in Australia. Although they argue with the town down the road, but you know, four meters of rain a year. We think we get rain yeah, in it's England. Crazy. Yeah, your leather shoes go mouldy and stuff like that. Yeah, up there. Yeah. Well, the, 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 your, your shoes go mouldy. If you leave your clothes hanging in the closet too long, if you don't, you know, wash them out and yeah. change things around, they'll start to go mouldy. It's just, it's just a different, different world, different climate. Yeah, that's and you, yeah, you got to drink your beer quickly or it goes warm. Well, and there, there is a bonus to that, isn't there? there is, <laughs> <laughs> playing, playing cricket. Oh, on, yes and no. <laughs> playing cricket on the beach with a, with a. a a cooler full of Great Northerns. It's um, it's a hell of a way of spending a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, yeah. There's there's worse things you could be doing. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Do you mm. know I've really enjoyed our chat today, and I'm I'm really grateful for your time. Um, it, please, ah, please thanks for getting in touch, Paul. No, I appreciate you. Please keep in touch. And be, but there is one thing that I have to ask you: Is there anything you'd like to add, alter, or correct in relation to the statement that you've made today? Well, no, but what I would say is if you ever ask me any of these questions um, under caution, I'd probably either not answer them or deny everything. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> and yep. I'm going to conclude this interview. No worries. <laughs>